the entanglement six six the entanglement from which we need to escape has its origin in the very same principle which gives rise to liberty and power it is the same principle applied under inverted conditions and here the author would draw particular attention wants to draw particular attention to the law that any sequence followed out in an inverted order must produce an inverted result for this goes a long way to explain many of the problems of life the physical world affords endless examples of the working of inversion in the dynamo the sequence commences with mechanical force which is ultimately transformed into the subtle power of electricity but invert this order commence by generating electricity and it becomes converted into mechanical force as in the motor in the once order in the one order the rotation of a wheel produces electricity and the opposite order electricity produces the rotation of a wheel by reason of the law that thoughts are things the evils which a man fears take form and plunge him into adverse circumstances which again prompt him into further wrong acts and from these come a fresh crop of fears which in their turn becomes externalized into fresh evils and thus arises a circulus from which there is no escape so long as the man recognizes nothing but his external acts as a causative power in the world of his surroundings this is the law of works the circle of karma the will of fate from which there appears to be no escape because the complete fulfillment of the law of our moral nature today is only sufficient for today and leaves no surplus to compensate the failure of yesterday. This is the necessary law of things as they appear from external observation only and so long as this conception remains the law of each man's subjective consciousness makes it a reality for him. What is needed therefore is to establish the conception that eternal acts are not the only cause of power but that there is another law of causation namely that of pure thought this is the law of faith the law of liberty for it introduces us to a power which is an, which is able to inaugurate a new sequence of causation not related to any past actions but this change of mental attitude cannot be brought about till we have laid hold of some fact which is sufficient to afford a reason for the change we require some solid ground for our belief in this higher law Ultimately, we find this ground in the great truth of the eternal relation between spirit and the universal and in the particular. When we realize that substantially there is nothing else but spirit and that we ourselves are reproductions in individuality of the intelligence and love which rule the universe, we have reached the firm standing ground where we find that we can send forth our thought to produce any effect we will. We have passed beyond the idea of two opposite requiring reconciliation into that of a duality in which there is no other opposite opposition than that of the inner and the outer of the same unity the polarity which is inherent in all being or inherent in all beings and when we realize that in virtue of this unity of our thought is possessed of illimitable creative power and that it is free to range where it will and is by no means bound down to accept as inevitable the consequences which if unchecked by renovated thought would flow from our past actions in its own independent creative power the mind has found a way out of the fatal circle in which its previous ignorance of the highest law had imprisoned it the unity of the spirit is found to result in perfect liberty the old sequence of karma has been cut off and a new and higher order has been introduced in the old order the line of thought received its quality, its quality from the quality of the actions and since they always they always fell short of perfection the development of a higher thought power from this root was impossible this is the order in which everything is seen from without it is inverted an inverted order but in the true order everything is seen from within it is the thought which determines the quality of the action and not vice versa and since thought is free it is at liberty to direct itself to the highest principles which thus spontaneously reproduce themselves in the outward acts so that both thoughts and actions are brought into harmony with the great eternal laws and become one 
than purpose with the universal mind. The man realizes that he is no longer bound by the consequences of his former deeds done in the time of his ignorance. In fact, that he never was bound by them except so far as he himself gave them the power or this power by false conceptions of the truth and thus recognizing himself for what he really is. The expression of the infinite spirit in individual personality. He finds that he is free, that he is a partaker of divine nature, not losing his identity but becoming more and more fully himself with an ever-expanding perfection following out a line of evolution whose possibilities are inexhaustible. But there is not in all men this knowledge. For the most part they, are, they still look upon God as an individual being what happened there? But there is not in all men this knowledge. For the most part they still look upon God as an individual being, external to themselves. And what the more instructed man sees to be unity of mind and identity of nature appears to the less advanced to be an external reconciliation between opposing personalities. Hence the whole range of conception which may be described as a messianic idea. This idea is not, as some seem to suppose, a misconception of the truth of being. On the contrary, when rightly understood it will be found to imply the very widest grasp of that truth, and it is from the platform of the supreme knowledge alone that an idea so comprehensive in its adaptation to every class of mind could have been evolved. It is the translation of the relations arising from the deepest laws of being into terms which can be realized even by the most unlearned. A translation arranges with such consummate skill a translation arranged with such consummate skill that as the mind grows in spirituality every stage of advance is met by a corresponding unfolding of the divine meaning. While yet even the crudest apprehension of the idea implied is sufficient to afford the required basis for an entire renovation of the man's thoughts concerning himself, giving him a standing ground from which to think of himself as no longer bounded or bound by the law of retribution for past offences, but is free to follow out the new law of liberty as a child of God. The man's conception of the modus operandi, or the motive of operation, of this emancipation or liberty may take the form of the grossest anthropomorphism or the most childish notions as to the satisfaction of the divine justice by vicarious or vicarious substitution but the working result will be the same he has got what satisfies him as a ground for thinking of himself in a perfectly new light and since the states of our subjective consciousness constitute the realities of our life of our life to afford him a convincing ground for thinking himself free is to make him free. So if you be, believe that you are free, then you are truly free. With increasing light, he may find that his first explanation of the modus operandi, or the operational motive, or the motive, was inadequate, but when he reaches the reaches stage, further investigation will show him that the great truth of his liberty rests upon a firmer foundation than the conventional inter interpretation of traditional dogmas and that it has roots in the great law of nature which are never doubtful and which can never be overturned and it is precisely because their whole action has its roots in the unchangeable laws of mind that there exists a perpetual necessity for presenting to men something which they can lay hold of as a sufficient ground for that change of mental attitude by which alone they can be rescued from the fatal circle which is figured under the symbol of the old serpent the dragon the devil the snake the devil right Satan. The hope and adumbration of such a new principle has formed the substance of all religions in all ages. However, misapprehended by the ignorant worshippers, and what 
whatever our individual opinions may be as to the historical facts of Christianity, we shall find that the great figures of liberated and perfected humanity which forms its centre fulfils its desire of all nations and that it sets forth the great ideal of divine power intervening to rescue man by becoming one with him or in communion or in union with him. This is the conception presented to us, whether we appre- apprehend it, understand it, comprehend it or not, it, in the most literally material sense, or as the ideal presentation of the deepest philosophic study of mental laws, or in whatever variety of ways we must combine, or we may combine these two extremes. The ultimate idea impressed upon the mind must always be the same. It is that there is a divine warrant for knowing ourselves to be the children of God and partakers of the divine nature. And when we thus realize that there is solid ground for believing ourselves free, by force of this very belief, we become free. The proper outcome of the study of the laws of spirit which constitute the inner side of things is not the gratification of a mere idle curiosity, nor the acquisition of abnormal powers, but the attainment of our spiritual liberty or freedom, emancipation, without having no, which no further progress is possible. When we have reached this goal, the old things that have passed away and all things have become new. The mystical seven days of the old creation have been fulfilled, and the first day of the new week dawns upon us with its resurrection up to a new life, expressing on the highest plane that great doctrine if the octave, which is science of the ancient temples are traced through nature, and which the science of the present day endorses, though ignorant of its supreme significance. When we have thus been made free by recognizing our oneness with infinite being, we have reached the termination of the old series of sequences and have gained the starting point of the new. The old limitations are found never to have had any existence save in our own misapprehension or misunderstanding or yeah, miscomprehension, misapprehension of the truth and one by one they fall off as we advance into clearer light. We find that the life spirit we seek in is, is in ourselves. The kingdom of heaven is within you. The spirit of God is within you. And having this for our centre, our relation to all else becomes part of a wondrous living order in which every part works in sympathy with the whole. And the whole in sympathy with every part. A harmony wide as infinitude and in which there are no limitations save those imposed by the law of love. The author has endeavoured in this short series of articles to sketch briefly the principal points of relation between spirit and ourselves and our surroundings. This subject has employed the intelligence of mankind from grey antiquity to the present day, or modern day, and no one thinker can ever hope to grasp it all in all its amplitude. But there are certain broad principles which we must all grasp. However, we may specialise our studies in detail, and these the author has sought to indicate with what degree of success the reader must form his own opinion. Work it out for yourself. Yeah. Study it, research it. Ponder it, meditate on it. Read this again, listen to this video again and come to realise it. Let him, however, however, lay firm hold of this one fundamental truth and the evolution of further truth from it is only a question of time. That there is only one spirit, however many the modes of its manifestation or its revelations or revealings. And that the unity of the spirit is the bond of peace. Two, the perversion of truth. There is a very general recognition, which is growing day by day more and more widespread, that there is a sort of hidden power somewhere there, somewhere which it is within our ability somehow or other to use. The ideas on this subject are exceedingly vague with the generality of people, but still they are assuming a more and more definite form, and that which they appear to be taking with the generality of the public is the recognition of the power of suggestion. The author supposes none of us doubts that there is such a thing as the power of suggestion and that it can produce very great results indeed and that it is par excellence a hidden power. It works behind the scenes, it works through what we know as the subconscious mind and consequently is its activity is not immediately recognisable or the source from which it comes. Now there is in some aspects its usefulness, its benefit, but in other aspects there is a source of danger because a power of this kind is obviously one which can be used 
either well or ill. In itself, it is perfectly neutral. It all depends on the purpose for which it is used and the character of the agent or the user who employs it. Or that vessel or vassal or that being who employs it. This recognition of the power of suggestion is in many instances taking a most undesirable form and the author commends to your notice in support of this observation numerous advertisements in certain classes of magazines. Many of you must have seen many specimens of that kind offering for a certain sum of money to put you in the way of getting personal influence. Mental power, power of suggestion, as the advertisements very unblushingly put it, for any purpose that you may desire. Some of them even go into further particulars, telling you the particular sorts of purposes for which you can employ this, all of them certainly being such uses as no one should ever attempt to make of it. Therefore, this recognition of the power of suggestion says even as a mere money-making power, to leave alone other misapplications of it is a feature which is taking hold, so as to say, of certain sections of the public who do not realise a higher platform in these things. It is deplorable that it should be so, but it is in the nature of things unavoidable. You have a power which can be used affirmatively and which can be used negatively, which can be used for higher purposes and can be used for lower purposes, and consequently you will find numbers of people who, as soon as they get hold of it, will at once think only of the lower purposes, not of the higher. In support of what the author says, although this is by no means, he supposes, we supposed, intended as a low application, probably it is intended as a high application, but he wasn't going to say that he agreed with it. He cannot say he agrees with it. But to show you, or all, that he was talking from actual facts, he will read a note which he made from a Daily Mail, from the Daily Mail. I think that's a UK or British magazine, uh, newspaper, of the 20th century, that he dare say some of you may have seen. It is an article headed by, or headed Killing by Prayer, and the article goes on to say that a certain circular has been sent round to the different hospitals and other places where the study of every section goes forward to this effect. In this circular, signed with the letters MC, the writer says that he accidentally heard of a person who was in the habit of praying from time to time for the death of one of the leading vivisectors and that always the man indicated died. That is why MC heard by chance during conversation at hotel dinner. That is what MC heard by chance during conversation at hotel dinner. Then thinking over this, MC goes on to say that he or she tried praying that the man most likely to cause suffering to innocent subjects by his experiments might be removed and the consequence was that about a fortnight later, one of the most distinguished medical scientists died. But the author did not know who the scientist in question was. He dare say, or he dare said at that time, some of you may be aware of the name. However, that is what the Daily Mail tells us, or told him, told him, or told everybody. And it also stated that the anti-vivisection societies were unanimous in condemning the circular, and very properly so. Now you see the sender of that circular, whoever he was, obviously thought he was doing a very good piece of work. The author himself, and by no was no means any friend of vivisection. He did not think anyone can have a real knowledge of the truth and remain in touch with it, but he certainly agreed with the anti-vivisection societies in condemning such a circular on that. You see, there is the assumption that prayer or mental power can be used to remove a person from the stage of life, and MC claims that he did it on the case of this particular scientist. That brings back another parallel, almost, that the author might say, an historical parallel to our mind, that of Dr. Anna Kingsford, taking place perhaps some 40 years ago, who claimed, of course she was a very strong anti-vivisectionist, that by thought power she caused the death of Claude Bernard, the great vivisection scientist of France. Certainly at the time that she put out her forces he did die, but on the other hand it has been remarked that it was from that very date that her own breakup commenced and never ceased till she herself passed into the other world. So you see these actions are likely to revert to the sender even if they are successful.
Now in this case, these two cases, the ultimate object was not a low one, it was one which was supposed to be for the benefit of humanity and of the dumb creation. But that does not justify the means. The maxim, the end justifies the means, is the great perversion of truth, and still more so if this hidden power, the power of suggestion, is used to injure anyone for a more personal motive than in these cases which the author has cited. The lower the motive, the lower the action becomes. And to suppose that because mental means are employed they make any difference in the nature of the act, it is a very great mistake. It has been sometimes the author's painful duty to sentence people to death for murder, and therefore he claims that he has a very fair knowledge of what differentiates murder from those cases in which life is taken which do not amount to murder. And speaking from the judicial experience of a great many years, because this guy was actually a judge in his time, and the trial of a larger number of cases which have involved the question whether the death penalty should be passed or not, he had no hesitation in saying that to kill by mental means is just as much murder as to kill by poison or the day. It is the old Jewish uh, belief, perhaps in the Torah, etc., in the Mishnah, that one Jew should not embarrass another Jew, cause him to get embarrassed and blush because of the fact that the, all the blood rushes to the cheeks, etc. He goes red, and that's like a type of murder because you've defamed them, you've embarrassed them in front of other people. Speaking judiciously, I should have not the least hesitation in hanging anyone who committed murder by means of mental suggestion. Psychological crime, remember, is crime just the same. Possibly it is more deeply dyed crime, that's in D-Y-E-D, -E because of the greater knowledge which must go along with it. And he says that the psychological criminal is worse than the ordinary criminal. One of the teachings of the Master is, probably talking about Christ, is on this very point. And the author refers you to the miracle of the fig tree. You know that he exhibited his power of killing not a person, not even an animal, but a tree. And when the disciples said to him, See how this tree which you cursed has withered away? He replied, Well, you can do exactly the same thing. And goes on to say, Nothing shall be impossible to you. Therefore, if you can kill fig trees, you can kill people. But forgive if you have aught against any favor, anything against anyone, that your heavenly Father may forgive you. Because you won't be forgiven unless you forgive that person. Okay, it's a principle, it's a command, etc. He says in effect, Now you have seen that this hidden power can be used to the destruction of life. At your peril use it otherwise than as a divine power. Use it with prayer to God and with forgiveness of all against whom you have any sort of grudge or ill feeling. And if its use is always prefaced in this way, according to the Master's directions, then nobody can use it to injure another, either in mind, body or estate. Perhaps some of you may be inclined to smile if the author used the word sorcery. But at the present day, under one name or another, scientific or semi-scientific, it is nothing but the old world sorcery which is trying to find its way among us as a hidden power. Sorcery is the inverted use of spiritual power. Or it's the reverse, or let's say the perverted 